He's an associate editor for IT Electronics Letters uh, and chair of the UK MC Group. So this is the main uh, forum for, for radar uh, and defense research here in the UK. In 2017, he was awarded the IET RSN Best Paper Award uh, and the Bob Hill Award um, in 2015. Uh, and most recently, he's been awarded a very prestigious, one of the most prestigious personal um, fellowships here in the UK from the Royal Academy of Engineering on the topic of multifunction RF systems. And under the umbrella of RF systems is also Isaac, and, and, and Matt uh, will be talking uh, to us about this. So over to you. Thank you, Christoph. Good afternoon, everyone. So I'm going to speak on a kind of radar-centric approach to this ISAC aspects. Um, just bring out my timer here, so I know I'm sticking to. Um, uh, yet, so and I've been collaborating with Christos recently on this perspective, and we hope to experimentally validate and demonstrate how you can do sensing and communications in a practical uh, deployment. Today's talk, I'm going to speak on multifunction RF, which Christos there mentioned as, as a subject of a new uh, fellowship for a five year program of research that I'm going to um, push on. I'll introduce the Arresta system, which is a prototype demonstrator test bed that we have here at UCL that we've been using to do multiple different research strands. Um, so, this is a field deployable sensor. Um, that we can use to validate some concepts we explore. I'll talk about index modulation, which is the particular ISEC methodology that we were interested in, um, and our interpretation of that, that concept that was put out there in the open literature. I'll show simulated uh, performance of what we expected to achieve with said methodology. That I have to thank uh, Murat Tamiz and the audience here for his excellent research work in that domain. And then the experimental results that we look to validate this with our arrestor system. And yeah, Colin, I have to thank him for his very hard work. And now Peters, who isn't here in delivering those trials. And then I'll try and conclude what we learned about doing this with our system. So the context here is um, my perspective may be slightly different, more perhaps more military challenge domain, uh, peace rather than commercial comms element. But and you can imagine a single platform that needs to accomplish many, many different things. Um, and those tasks may have been uh, traditionally undertaken by discrete different sensors. You may have to then deploy 20 different boxes with their own DSP, their own antennas, their own processing chain, their own capabilities that are totally isolated and incompatible with each other on a single platform here, ships are used as just an, a nominal example. So the independent growth of radar and communications, having them totally separated, will re results in increasing weight, volume of all of these sensors from compute and DSP and systems. The increasing antenna array sizes and radar cross-section for your own platform potentially, and then electromagnetic compatibility issues overall. This is just a tiny snapshot into why we want to perhaps look at tighter integration between uh, radar and communications. In the end, I guess, in a, in a world where hardware is moving to a much more agile, flexible, and software-defined concept, then in the end, the aperture, if you digitize as early as you can behind that, it's a parallel process that you can do many different tasks once everything's in the digits to one person, um, it's uh, perhaps ES or understanding the environment out there and other illuminators, another person you can do passive radar processing with the exact same digits. So um, with hardware advancements and advancements in DSP capabilities, we're now living in a time that we can merge capabilities and have um, joint, a system that can perform joint tasks either in parallel or in series using a form of resource management potentially. Okay, so that's perhaps the set, set in the scene as to justify why we want to and what challenges we want to apply here. The UCL Arresta system. Okay, so we built a system here at UCL called Arresta. It's built on a Xilinx RF system on a chip, which have been out now for a number of years. What is an RF SOC? Well, an RF SOC is um, a FPGA that has a very tightly integrated components that include 
ADCs to digitize signals, DACs to transmit signals, FPGA to do the compute, and also some ARM core processors um, to be able to do some other types of compute outside of an FPGA. So you have a pr processing logic side, you have a processing system side, you have memory, and all of this is, is tightly integrated underneath that fan there. That image is showing the development board with all the breakouts, inputs, and outputs for that single chip underneath that fan. Uh, that's a ZCU111 for those that like serial numbers. And this is the first generation of this type of device. We're now, I think, at a third generation capability, which has advanced the faster ADC and DAC rates. Here you'll note some of the bits, uh, depths of the AD DACs and ADCs, and the number of channels that that has access to. That's eight channels transmit and eight channels receive. There is variants that also have 16 channels in some cases. And here we're talking about multi giga samples per second. So it's four giga samples per second ADCs and six and a half giga samples per second DACs. And this is per channel. Um, so that's a real fire hose of data there that on transmit or on receive. And it's an excellent capability that allows you to perhaps do this advanced multifunction concepts and build that build around this uh, a form of framework, which is what we did. So the system itself is built on uh, an RF SOC, um, but we didn't just buy an RF SOC from, from DigiKey and rebrand it as something UCL made. Um, that, that would be a, a bad PR exercise. What we've done is acquire this development board, and that's a blank canvas, okay, as any FPGA is. What we've done then is build on top of the commercial hardware, custom RF hardware, Linux kernel drivers, FPGA configurations, user space C lang um, language libraries, Python application space, and then a command and control software. Um, and this stack all works together that, to represent now a flexible sensor that we can operate across multiple modalities. Um, it's um, reference designs are uh, provided in some case, but they're limited and inflexible and often not going to be the exact type of niche use case that everybody else has in this room. We started from scratch with this and the task of configuring and adapting it is complex digital system like an RF SOC is a significant one, but the benefit and the payoff is coming now through our ability to now perform multiple roles with a single piece of hardware. There is alternatives here. I'm not paid for by, by Vavado or, or Lila, um, Xilinx. Um, it happens to be a very capable system. There is alternative SDRs, and that general software definedness is the future, I think, of capabilities here. Um, but we found this to be a very capable system once you've invested that, that ma initial man hours um, to get up to, to this point. You need strong knowledge of FPGA, Vavado coding, HDL, and software development. And some papers here at the bottom um, uh, present the, the early work with the system. As an agile di digital solution, um, an RFSOC can be figured to operate a number of different sensors. Some examples here, non-exhaustive, could be an active radar, you're transmitting your waveform uh, and capturing your own waveform. That could be also done in monostatic, or we were hearing about bi-static deployments as well, and the benefits of that. So you can have this modular scalable solution, having multiple nodes clocked, triggered, and then capturing in different geometries. You could deploy this as a passive radar. Passive radar, diff different definitions to different people sometimes, but what I mean here is that is when you're using an illuminator opportunity, a comms signal potentially, like digital television is a very suitable one. It has good high power transmit, relatively good bandwidths, um, uh, and simple enough um, to, to digitize and capture sub gigahertz frequencies. Um, electronic surveillance is, is the domain of just understanding the RF spectrum, understanding its activity, understanding the signals that are out there. That's probably going to be more important with advanced systems that are trying to be agile in the future, because you'll need to know what bands are active, what signals are where. Are you either trying to move away from those signals? Do you recognize that signal as, as friendly, non-friendly? And that's a whole challenge in its own right. And then the topic we're talking about today, which is joint radar communications. Traditionally, all of those different tasks would be undertaken by different hardware solutions requiring multiple sensors on one platform. But with current advanced digital solutions, it's possible to try and fuse that into a single device. Some of the research that we've looked at 
um, with the system, with experimental research by its nature, is we've looked at multi-band classification of drones uh, using this hardware where we classified the payload on a drone using the microdoppler signatures um, at S, C, and W band. We have a radar communications uh, paper, myself and Christos, with Murat Tamirzi and Colin uh, on experimental study, and that's the focus of the results I'll show later. We have a Internet of Things classification of the waveforms that are present, which have a certain type of protocol, which is LoRa, uh, in fact, detecting and classifying the parameters of that. Active and passive joint sensing, where both active radar and passive radar is happening simultaneously at different frequency bands from one sensor. And then a multi-static deployment, where we're sensing the target moving out and coming back with diff from different nodes. Moving towards some array designs, we've seen some massive MIMO array and what arrays can do for your sensing capabilities. Um, so we're moving to um, <clears throat> array capabilities on receive as part of a ubiquitous deployment where we would fraud, uh, flood light a region and then beam form on receive in order to sense the environment. Okay, radar centric ISAC though. The particular type of ISAC that we were interested in. Um, came through this publication here, which is this major com uh, publication referenced to the bottom there. Um, so this is <clears throat> taking some metrics, some index indexes, and then modulating your communication signals on top of that. In fact, the indexes are really up to you in terms of what parameters do you want to, to modulate data onto. But in this example paper, they use carrier frequency, the antenna, um, that, uh, that, and that, it, that it comes from, for example. This system transmitted rectangular pulses. It was a simulation-based study, and the receiver acquired some channel information in the first case. And so a sequence of different signals, marked by red and blue, came out of these two antennas, and therefore could be received by a comms node in the scene and decode the data. Has anyone in the room heard of or read that major comm paper? Was this one, one, two? Okay, a couple of people. So yeah, I think that was a, a useful um, concept that sparked our interest. Further than that, I think an experimental study was undertaken, not by us, by, by those authors, that used a system to show how perhaps if you have, in this case, these four antennas on the bottom here, and you were sending different frequency signals marked by their different color, you could then start communicating by the index of the antenna and the central frequency of the waveform you're sending. And the proposal here is then you're sensing the environment and you're a person or a vehicle and you're communicating to that other user or base station. Um, the number of bits that, that you can have access to is shown here. So that with these various frequency combinations, if you just have two antennas, this is the, the permutations that you can step through. Um, the CSER randomly chooses a subset of carrier frequencies for each radar pulse, and it randomly allocates the selected carrier frequencies across the antennas. A multi-carrier agile joint radar communications concept was being deployed here, and it employs classical radar waveforms uh, with a frequency agile radar, bar acronym there, randomly to allocate the frequencies among its antennas from pulse to pulse. So I'm just talking about the central frequencies here and the antennas. I haven't said what waveform is being transmitted. So you can send a, a, a linear frequency modulated waveform. This is this is bread and butter for radar engineers. This is a trusted type of waveform. It provides good match filtering, pulse compression, such that you get good signal noise ratio on your target. You get good range resolution and the Doppler tolerances are acceptable. So um, you can take a very well-known radar waveform and now start changing these parameters slightly on a pulse to pulse basis and now we're doing both sensing and communications. Um, so the embedded digital message in the section of the carrier frequencies and their allocations kind of being defined here. We've got LR antennas, LK of them being used, M frequencies, K frequencies being used. Some examples of then <clears throat> how this would come through. Example one, you have these subsets of different frequencies that you can transmit and your information bits are then encoded in this. If you've got M equals four, number of carrier frequencies, K2, subset of those, then you're sending two each time of the four combinations, and you end up with just two bits of information you can send. And this is on a per pulse basis, okay? So, um, <clears throat> and we'll come to what that has in terms of influence on your data throughput opportunity. 
If you advance that now and having four antennas, uh, and then in this case, two radar pulses, of, um, K equals two for each radar pulse, and each of the carrier frequencies be transmitted by two different antennas, and we're, we've got that permutation and combination options as well. So we um, read that paper, were inspired by it, and then wanted to take this on as an experimental option. So what we decided was rather than use the transmit antenna as one of the indexes, we stuck with the central frequency and the bandwidth. We then thought of perhaps using polarization as a metric, although on reflection now, I think it's perhaps not the best option, to be honest. Of course, with a line of sight, no reflections, perfect world, polarization is maintained perfectly, but we don't live in that world. So that fidelity of sensing the polarization of the original waveform will be changed and evolving anyway. But in our cases, we did demonstrate it's possible to do experimentally in an open field environment. This may be not a recommended index overall. Um, so you can imagine here, you've got your ISAC transmitter, you have your communication data you want to send. We then used the two polarizations almost just to have two channels of data and sensing occurring in parallel. Uh, VPOL data was then index modulated with its central frequency and its bandwidth of the lin linear frequency modulated signal, and it was transmitted likewise with the other RF chain on HPOL. This was then being simultaneously received in the scene with uh, aligned polarized antennas to the NH for its pencil um, providing ability to do our um, estimator on these parameters, which is the central frequency, the polarization, and bandwidth. Uh, the polarization was calculated by comparing their H and B uh, relative amplitudes, and then we can demodulate the data on this side overall. Okay. Further details provided on the method are shown in that paper there. So prior literature showed that index modulation is a radar-centric method achieving joint radar comms. We implemented this on Arresto. We did both lab and field trials. We chose some frequencies and bandwidths and polarizations on two parallel channels. Other indexes you could pick, for example, is up and down chirps. You could pick your pulse duration as an index, um, or you can start adding in further complexities to your waveform, maybe having fractional or broken up FMTWs or putting phase modulations in there. In our case, we were transmitting this within a S-band IFM band, the Wi-Fi band, um, and we were taking step sizes down in low megahertz size step sizes, both our central frequencies and our bandwidths. So it's a it's an LFM that's kind of breathing and walking up and down, and that's the data that's occurring across it. <clears throat> In this case, is to separate its um, LFMs being transmitted as a baseband example. But here we have eleven bandwidth options with one megahertz spacing, forty different frequencies, central frequencies we can use. And in some earlier cases, we looked at three polarization options. So not constantly having V and H always transmitting, but do V, H, or both, V, H, or both. And that's, that's another index. So this starts creating a trade-off space that you can operate in. What we are interested in uh, for communications, we're interested in throughput. What is our data throughput opportunity here? For a radar perspective, we're interested in signal noise ratio or a Kramer Al lower bounds. So the, this, this graph on the left-hand side has three different pulse lengths, one micro, 10, and 100 micro. For the shortest pulse length, the shortest radar pulse, we get the highest comms rate because we're doing more pulses per second. But radar would like a longer pulse to get more energy on target. So this is, this is where we're playing around with now. <clears throat> um, for, for, for those longer pulses, you can see we're, 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 we're much lower data rates here. Um, but, but 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 the the Kramer Al lower bounds and, and the estimate accuracies that you can achieve will be will be higher. So I, I would imagine, and not to jump to conclusions part at the end, but I would imagine anything that wants to be operational in the space needs to start making choices dynamically between those perspectives. At some point within any given scenario, maybe communications is a priority. At another point, maybe sensing is a priority, and you need to be able to move between those two aspects. And um, of course, in radar, um, if you have a low SNR, you don't know what isn't, you don't know what's out there you can't see. If that's the right way to describe it. 
So you would need to maybe go back to a search mode at certain points to find new targets, revert to your high comms rates as per requirements, and then go back to, to, to again, readdressing those targets. So dynamically choosing between this trade-off space will be very important. Detecting our polarization was merely at looking at the comparison sort of power here. And we looked at polarization leakage ratio, but as I said, polarization will evolve with reflections as well. Our processing took both channels in and parallel, compared polarizations and extracted those other parameters, frequency and bandwidths to get our symbols. The bandwidth index itself. Now I'm changing the bandwidth of a pulse. For radar, bandwidth is our range resolution. We were talk, we're hearing about that in previous talks here. So for a static situation where I have a target that should just peak, appear like a Gaussian or our, our match filter response of it, I'm now getting a fluctuating static target because its resolution is changing pulse to pulse. So this means you need to correct for this. Either you just uh, low pass filter to the worst bandwidth or you try and uh, interpolate in the best way possible to, to try and correct for some of these problems of putting comms into your sensing signal. So I'm, this is an example to show what that effect looks like. <clears throat> um, we, we're then looking at the polarization. This is all of our symbol error rate estimations uh, against what what performance we expect based on the indexes we're applying. And here again, we're looking at some results showing it throughput versus signal noise ratio. We have different constellation sizes based on how many polarizations, bandwidths, frequency step sizes, and, and bandwidth step sizes we're applying. The higher SNR is required to perform higher higher order modulation sizes. Um, this is some sample rates, and this was done at the ISM band at 2.4 gigs. The communication throughput, again, you can see how uh, pulse duration is the biggest factor here. The smallest pulse duration pushing into the highest communication data rates uh, with a constellation size of 660. Radio communication can achieve higher data rates of these short pulses, but SNR is being hammered. Pulse duration <clears throat> as well, you can see how um, with these different modulated signals with index modulations of bandwidths and central frequencies, our signal to noise ratios really start varying quite significantly. This is plotted in linear SNR, but depending on the pulse duration size we have. Um, so it, it's these detrimental effects to the consistent response of a target need to be corrected for. And again, this is a trade-off space that we're playing across here. We need to think about radar received signal SNR, our throughput, and our pulse duration on the bottom there. You would want to end up doing a set of pulses of similar duration, so you could do coherent processing interval and get range Doppler surfaces from a radar perspective. Um, but there's nothing stopping you from then moving between different pulse durations based on requirements. In fact, radars, even um, air traffic control radar systems might use long and short pulses to, in order to do shorter or longer range sensing. But they're in a fixed manner, and they do that repeatedly. More agile sensors in the in current and in the future would dynamically perhaps look at changing this pulse duration such to meet your given requirement on data throughput or on target SNR. Here we can see how um, the number of bits we're, we're able to transmit with different constellation sizes based on if we have all three polarizations operating, but with 20 frequency step sizes, 10 or 40, and 11 bandwidth and uh, options versus six, or again, back to 11. Uh, the highest constellation size here being 1320, becoming a 10 bit option. There's a bit of inefficiency there in terms of the number of con constellation and the number of bits we can send. Okay. Then there's a, a dictionary um, selection option where you can try and pick the most separable of those to produce your still 10 bits of data to transmit. Just go through here. So it's possible to reach some megabits per second data rates when the LFMs are pushed to very short um, uh, pulse durations. However, that will significantly impact the radar performance um, because you're trying to integrate a larger number of multiple pulses can be a solution to improve that. But if you have these changes evolving at very short pulses and the changing center frequency and bandwidth, um, that integration is not, uh, it takes a lot of correction um, post-processing to ensure you can do that effectively. 
Pulse durations um, should be selected to be reasonable to perform both communications and radar with their desired performances. Um, and we're seeing here now talking about maybe even to this megabits per second opportunity, but that's down to the one microsecond pulse durations. And then I'll go on to the experimental results now. So initially we did this just by a loopback test with our uh, arrestor system. Here we're transmitting and receiving back to ourselves as well as having a reference signal, which we then um, did FMCW, because that's the type of RF and radar waveforms we were using, uh, de-chirping. These initial tests use six and 11 meter cables, nine different 40 megahertz LFM chirps at five megahertz spacing at 2.4 gigs, and just a three bit encoded waveform. The comms payload, we used the sentence, the quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog, which was 360 bits of data. Therefore, 120 waveforms were transmitted to communicate that. Here you can see um, our loop back from a radar perspective is not that exciting. It's just a consistent range return of that, of that length, but there is some fluctuations, hard to see on the screen, some fluctuations of that because it has this comms modulation of central frequency and bandwidth supply. The comms decoding offline on the radar on the data from this raw received mode. Each chirp was FFT threshold and then enable central frequency to be determined. The central frequencies then were related back to the symbol. And the plot shows four of those examples there. And then we're starting to estimate these various symbols of the chirps that we return. Our system isn't very flat for frequency. We have some roll off there. So that's why you're seeing that shaping. And then on our comms receiver that would be in the field. This is us um, receiving the indexes, being converted into symbols, and then converted into ASCII text. So this is, you know, ISAT happening, being decoded as part of a secondary node, the comms receiver in the scene. A good agreement between the measurements and the simulations were observed in general. Only central frequency index was used in the measurements via loopback. The pulse duration was short, uh, was 0.1 milliseconds, so it's quite long. And depending on the frequency spacing, uh, two to 10 dB difference was seen between measurements. Uh, the trend of both uh, measurements and simulations are the same, and they're, they're relatively close here, although uh, simulations generally achieved higher data throughputs than the experiment due to maybe mismatching and estimation accuracies of these various indices. As you get to finer and finer step sizes, this is 0.25 megahertz. Uh, central frequency step size change. It's going to be harder and harder to accurately estimate those, particularly in a congested contest environment. Maybe there's many other signals occurring at the same time. Proof of contrast, more rigorous tests were carried out and how the symbol error rate influenced frequency um, by central frequency spacing was investigated. So this was five megahertz spacing down to a quarter megahertz. And then our symbol error rates here, you can see for um, <clears throat> the, the purple line, these errors started creeping up much earlier in our, as SNR was being reduced. And in this other case here, when we had different length pulses, uh, the shortest pulses had the uh, er symbol error rate starts again occurring higher early on. The longer pulses, higher amount of energy, easier to correctly estimate those. And then we took this whole system, we went outside. The photographs are not coming up so well, but this is our transmitter unit. This is our receiver in the field. This is a static target, not moving. And this is a PhD student who is moving. So here we have um, uh, co-pole and cross-pole results. And you can see quite clearly, you can estimate different polarization amplitudes. In this case, it's simple. It might not be in other times. So uh, that's our co-pole and this is our cross and cross-pole examples. So the data start coming through like this and we have different uh, pulse lengths and then responses. That's a static target. This is the loop back uh, from receive to transmit antenna. And then this is the, this, the moving individual in the scene. As we started the PhD student, as we started going to shorter and shorter pulse lengths, we now miss the target because we have insufficient SNR because it's too short, but we're hitting the highest comms rates. So that's a practical demonstration of what that trade-off is. Deeper analysis is shown here where the radar return signal noise ratio and communications throughput is shown as a function of chirp duration and this trade off space we keep talking about. And then on the right hand side, there is a trade off between the maximal throughput, the pre morale lower bound, your estimate on the range of the target, and the radar returns SNR 
value. Here, DC talks about dual channel when we're using both H and V simultaneously, and SC if we're just using one channel in sequence in some manner. Okay, so I ran through um, our perspective on a radar-centric communications and sensing concept that was pu published before we took it on. Um, I talked about a system that we're using to experimentally validate that. I spoke on these trade-offs between the sensing performance and the comms performance. Um, and I mentioned briefly that some corrections are needed to the radar waveforms if you apply these metrics. It doesn't come for free. You do need to correct for them in some manner. Um, we validated this in over-the-air trials. Future work, we'd like to incorporate and advance our comms rates to higher and higher values if possible, and maybe dynamically have the sensor start choosing between these trade-offs in a real in-situ experiment. Um, yeah, we're keen to collaborate and conduct joint experiments. Uh, if those would like to get in touch with me later, please, we're always happy to, to talk on that. And we have the capability now through this sensor we've developed. Happy to take any questions. Any questions? Uh, thank you for that. Uh, really, really very very bold to do polarization index modulation yeah. and such great results. Uh, I have three questions if you allow me. The first one is, uh, do you have any kind of a switching hardware in, in the current device that allows you to switch from one channel to the other as for the high simple rate? So um, we weren't channel switching. We were running two channels simultaneously with these various symbols coming out of them as FMCW signals. The system itself has eight channels total. We were using two in that first instance. Um, so we could, in theory, if the RF front ends were, were arranged, we could have eight channels transmitting in parallel eight sequences of FMCW chirps. Uh, FMCWs are fairly resilient to um, um, interference uh, themselves so um, and so we that is very much possible you could try and have them separated in frequency as well to enhance uh, isolation between them but yeah we are a multi-channel system Jeff. okay uh, the other one was uh, you mentioned the MLE estimator that you have uh, but I didn't see any bitter rates uh, so what's yeah. your experience on using MLE estimators were they were they too hard to in terms of latency and computational requirements and that could be cut in terms of symbol rate per error so i i deleted a few slides from a bigger slide stack for this and that had some of the bit error rates within them um so it, it, we had um reasonable plus zero db um snrs we had reasonable bit error rates that, that we were operating and very happy about that you could share that through another slide stack if you're interested and some of it's shown in the papers that we're at was published and it was sitting in the back there. But um, it was seemed to be an effective manner. We, we were estimating this real time. Um, so the comms node is estimating those parameters in situ through the FPGA. Um, so some other projects we've got experience on doing uh, matching uh, against known known potential waveforms. So that's been found to be quite effective. And, and, and that was a, it was a more of a staged M M -X So we didn't do the whole constellation. If I remember correctly, so we, I mean, it's a huge compilation of what we saw the experiments. So we would do stages first, let's say the bandwidth, detecting the bandwidth in an MLE function, and uh, and uh, the same for the carrier, and then yeah, uh, yeah. two stages yeah. for those two premises. Okay, this last question. Yeah, uh, uh, you got for uh, for LFM modulation. Yeah. Uh, got any plans going for phase coded? because it's likely to improve your performance. And yes. Just pull out the constellation from your simulation, your communication constellation. Yeah, so we we're absolutely, uh, that's ongoing work right now. Uh, just not able to, to show those slides and show those results yet, um, but hope to maybe in a future event. Um, phase coded, absolutely. You actually could then, if you put more phase modulations in a single chirp, your data rates will significantly increase. Um, so great potential there as well. You'll need, an advanced system that has got capability, I hope, and we believe that we can put those modulations. And you need to understand what that does to the radar sensing performance. These discrete changes in phase within a pulse, maybe are, isn't so pretty, but yeah. maybe we can fix that. I have some results, so maybe we can discuss. Yeah, happy to talk. That'd be great. But it, it looks very good on paper. And great. Thank cool. you. No worries. Just if I can have a comment on that, I mean, the, the, big, the one big advantage here is that we don't need channel estimation. 
because you can estimate the bandwidth and the carry frequency without estimating the yeah. response of the channel. When once you add phase, you're gonna have to start doing channel estimate. Any other okay, question? Nothing online, I guess. Okay, so thanks again, uh, Matt, for this.